The Battle of Pilkham Ridge was the opening attack of the Third Battle of Ypres in the First World War. The British Fifth Army, supported by the Second Army on the southern flank and the French One Re Army on the northern flank, attacked the German Fourth Army, which defended the Western Front from Lille northwards to the Ypres salient in Belgium and on to the North Sea coast. On 31 July, the Anglo-French armies captured Pilkham Ridge and areas on either side, the French attack being a great success. After several weeks of changeable weather, heavy rain fell during the afternoon of 31 July. In the 19th Corps area in the centre and on the right of 18 Corps, three reserve brigades advanced from the Black Line to the main objective and pressed on towards the Red Line, the furthest that exploitation on local initiative was allowed for in the plan. The weather changed and rain began to fall, cutting off the advanced British troops from view, just as German regiments from specialist counter-attack Eingreif divisions advanced over Passchendaele Ridge. To avoid being rolled up, the reserve brigades retreated through the Green Line to the Black Line, which the British artillery observers could still see, the German infantry were prevented from advancing further by massed artillery and small arms fire. A substantial amount of ground had been captured by the British and French, except on the Gaelevelt Plateau on the right flank, where only the Blue Line and part of the Black Line were captured. A large number of casualties were inflicted on the German defenders during the attack and 5,626 prisoners were taken, the German Eingreif divisions recaptured some ground from the Ypres Rulers Railway northwards to St. Julian, forcing the British back to the Black Line. For the next few days, both sides made local attacks to improve their positions, much hampered by the wet weather. The rains had a serious effect on operations in August, causing more problems for the British and French, who were advancing into the area devastated by artillery fire and partly flooded by the unseasonable rain. A local British attack on the Gaelevelt Plateau on 2 August was postponed several times because of the weather until 10 August and the second big general attack, due on 4 August, did not begin until 16 August. The Green Line objectives on the plateau were not captured until the Battle of the Menin Road Ridge on 20 September, after the principal role in the offensive was transferred to the Second Army in three weeks sunshine, and fresh breezes dried much of the ground. The Third Battle of Ypres became controversial while it was being fought, with disputes about the predictability of the August deluges and for its mixed results which in much of the writing in English is blamed on apparent misunderstandings between Goff and Haig and on faulty planning, rather than on the resilience of the Fourth Army. Chapter 1 – Background Chapter 1 – Section 1 – Strategic Background Operations in Flanders, Belgium had been desired by the British Cabinet, Admiralty and War Office since 1914. In January 1916, Haig ordered General Henry Rawlinson to plan an attack in the Ypres salient. The need to support the French army during the Battle of Verdun 21 February, the 18th of December 1916 and the demands of the Somme battles 1 July, the 18th of November 1916, absorbed offensive capacity of the British for the rest of the year. Marshal Joseph Joffrey was replaced as the French commander-in-chief by General Robert Nivelle in December, who planned a breakthrough offensive by the French armies on the Western Front during the spring of 1917, to return to a war of manoeuvre and a decisive victory. The Nivelle offensive began on 9 April with the British Battle of Arras, followed on 16 April by the French Second Battle of the Aisne. The British attack was a big success but the French plan to defeat decisively the West here was a strategic failure. Morale in the French armies collapsed, mutinies occurred and Nivelle was replaced by General Philippe Pétard. While the French recuperated, offensive action on the Western Front could only come from the Biff and in June 1917, the principle of a Flanders campaign was reluctantly approved by the British War Cabinet. On the French sector, Pétard intended to maintain an active defence and planned three limited Bataille redressement lavishly to be supported with artillery, aircraft and manpower, sufficient to guarantee success and restore morale. In early June, at about the same time as the British attack on Mazines Ridge, the 6th Army would attack on the Aisne Front. In Flanders, the 1st Army was to participate in the British Flanders Offensive and in mid-July, the 2nd Army would attack at Verdun, 
as the main Flanders offensive began. In early June, the crisis in the French armies led to the postponement of the 6th Army attack on the Chemin des Dames but during June and July, the concentration of the 1st Army north of Ypres continued. Chapter 1 Section 2 British Plans 1916-1917 In late 1916, the Second Army Commander, General Herbert Plumer was ordered to plan an attack out of the Ypres salient but Haig was dissatisfied with the limited scope of the plan to capture Mazines Ridge and Pilkham Ridge further north. In early 1917, Haig calculated that the Nivelle offensive would force the Germans out of Belgium or that the 4th Army in Flanders would give up divisions to reinforce the armies further south. Plumer revised the plan to capture Mazines and Pilkham Ridges and advance onto the Gaelevelt Plateau, a later attack would capture the plateau, Passchendaele and beyond. The plan required 35 divisions and 5,000 guns, far more artillery than the BIF possessed. At General Headquarters Colonel George McMullen proposed to capture the Galeveld Plateau with a massed tank attack, but a reconnaissance in April, found that narrow defiles between three woods on the plateau and broken ground obstructed the approaches. Tanks would have to detour north of Belward Lake to Westhook then wheel right at the Albrechts de Long. Plumer produced another plan to take Mazines Ridge and the west end of the Galeveld Plateau first and Pilkham Ridge soon after. The 4th Army commander, General Henry Rawlinson proposed to take Mazines Ridge first, then the Galeveld Plateau and Pilkham Ridge within 47 to 72 hours. On the 14th of February, McMullen submitted the GHQ 1917 plan and on the 7th of May, Haig set the 7th of June for the attack on Mazines Ridge, the Flanders offensive to begin some weeks later. A week after the Battle of Mazines Ridge, Haig informed the army commanders that the strategy was to wear down the 4th Army, secure the Belgian coast and advance to the Dutch frontier. Passchendaele Ridge was to be taken and the advance continued to rulers and thou out, to cut the Bruges to Courtrake Railway supplying the 4th Army from Ypres to the Belgian coast. Once the railway was cut, the 4th Army would attack along the coast, combined with Operation Hush in support of the main advance, along with the Belgian army in between. On 13 May, Haig appointed General Hubert Goff to command the Flanders Offensive and McMullen gave Goff the GHQ 1917 plan. Chapter 2 – Prelude Chapter 2 – Section 1 – Allied Preparations Goff met the Corps commanders in June and the third objective of the GHQ 1917 plan, including the German Wilhelm Stellung was added to the first day objectives. A fourth objective was added as the limit of advances that could be made on local initiative if the German defense collapsed in places. Five divisions from the Second Army, nine divisions and a brigade of the Fifth Army, and two divisions from the French First Army were to attack. A preparatory bombardment was planned from 16 to 25 July and the 2nd Army was to capture outposts in the Warnerton Line, to simulate an advance beyond Mazines Ridge and stretch the German defence. The 5th Army was to attack along a 14,000 yards front from klein Zillebeck northwards to the ypres Staden Railway, the French I Corps on the northern flank attacking with two divisions, from the 5th Army boundary to the flooded area just beyond Steenstra. Infantry trained on a replica of the German trench system, built using information from aerial photographs and trench raids, some platoons had specialist training for attacking pillboxes and blockhouses. The Flondern I Stellung was 10,000 to 12,000 yards behind the front line, well beyond the fourth objective. Behind Flondern I Stellung were Flondern II Stellung and Flondern III Stellung. In his operation order to the Corps commanders of the 27th of June, Goff gave the Green Line as the main objective and that patrols of fresh troops were to probe towards the Red Line, to exploit any German disorganization or collapse. The plan was more ambitious than the plan devised by Plumer for an advance of 1,000 to 1,750 yards on the first day and Major General John Davidson, the BIF Director of Operations, complained of ambiguity as to what was meant by a step-by-step -step attack with limited objectives. Davidson suggested an advance of no more than 1,500 to 3,000 yards, to increase the concentration of British artillery fire. Goff replied that temporarily undefended ground should be occupied, which was more likely in the first attack, with its longer preparation than later attacks, 
After discussions at the end of June, Haig endorsed the Fifth Army Plan. Chapter 2 Section 1 Subsection 2 Aerial Preliminaries A planned slow build-up of Allied air activity over the Ypres salient was changed to a maximum effort after a weather delay on the 11th of July, due to the effectiveness of the reply by the Luftstreitkraft. The Germans had been sending larger formations into action and on 12 July, a record amount of air activity occurred. 30 German fighters engaged Royal Flying Corps and French fighters of the Aeronautique Militaire in a dogfight lasting an hour, the RFC losing 9 aircraft and the Luftstreitkraft 14. The Germans resisted the British and French air effort until the end of July, when their losses forced a change to more defensive tactics. On 1 July, the opening attack was postponed at the request of Anthine as the French needed more time to prepare artillery emplacements. On 7 July, Goff asked for another postponement of five days, some British heavy artillery had been lost to the German counter-bombardment, some had been delayed and bad weather had hampered the programme of counter-battery fire. Haig agreed to delay until 28 July and then Anthine requested another postponement because the poor weather had slowed his artillery preparation. After Goff supported Anthine, Haig reluctantly agreed to wait until 31 July, despite endangering Operation Hush, which had to catch the high tides from 7 to 8 August, a delay might force a postponement for a month. Chapter 2 Section 2 Allied Plan the set-piece attack was to begin with an advance by the Second Army on the right towards the Warnerton line with parts of five divisions to red, blue and green lines on a 9,100 yards front. The Fifth Army was to advance through the German front position, the Albrechtstellung and Wilhelmstellung to the blue, black and green objective lines, which were about 1,000, 2,000 and 3,500 yards distant, at any of which a halt could be called depending on German resistance. Patrols from the reserve brigades were to advance towards the red line 1000 to 1500 yards further on, at the discretion of divisional commanders, if the German defence opposite had collapsed. The 5th Army had 752 heavy guns and 1442 field guns, with support from the 893 guns and mortars of the French 1st Army on the northern flank and 322 guns of X Corps in the 2nd Army to the south. Goff also intended to use 120 Mark IV tanks to support the attack, with another 48 in reserve. Goff had five cavalry divisions and a cavalry brigade was to be deployed if 14 Corps reached its objectives. The preliminary bombardment was to destroy German strong points trenches and cut barbed wire, counter-battery fire was to suppress the 4th Army artillery. The first wave of British infantry would advance under a creeping barrage moving at 100 yards every four minutes, followed by troops advancing in columns or in artillery formation. British intelligence predicted that the Albrechtstellung would be the main line of resistance and that advances would not be counter-attacked unless the British advance reached it, except on the Gaelevelt Plateau, where the Germans were expected to counterattack at once given the importance of its commanding ground to both sides. Two corps faced the Gaelevelt Plateau and was given closer objectives than the other corps, only 1,000 yards forward at klein in the south and 2,500 yards at the junction with 19 corps, on the Ypres Rulers Railway to the north two corps had five divisions, unlike the other 5th Army Corps, which had four each, two for the attack and two in reserve. Three two corps divisions and a brigade from the 18th Division, would attack supported by about 43% of the 5th Army artillery, plus the artillery of X Corps on the northern flank of the 2nd Army. Twelve brigades of field artillery supported each division, bringing the artillery support available to two corps to approximately 1,000 guns. Goff allocated a disproportionate amount of the 5th Army artillery to two corps for the 31st of July, compared to the other corps, with an average of 19% of the 5th Army artillery each. The green line from the southern flank of 19 Corps, through 18 Corps to the northern flank of 14 Corps and the French I Corps area required an advance of 2,500 to 3,500 yards. Chapter 2 Section 2 Subsection 2 French Flank 
The French 1 Re Armée comprised I Corps and 36 Corps. The French had 245mm field guns, 277 trench artillery pieces, 176 heavy howitzers and mortars, 136 heavy guns and 64 super heavy guns and howitzers, 22 being 305mm or larger, making 893 guns and mortars for 4.3 miles of front. The French relieved the Belgian divisions along the 4.3 miles from Borsinga to Nordskoot from 5 to 10 July. From Borsinga north to Steenstra the front line ran along the canal and no man's land was 200 to 300 yards wide, further north the land had been underwater since the Belgian inundations during the Battle of the Isar in 1914. A paved road between Renninger, Nordskoot and Drie Grockton ran on a bank just above the water and the Kemmelbeek, Iperli, is a canal and march of art slash Saint Janspec emptied into the floods. At Maison du Passeur the French had an outpost over the canal, connected by a footbridge. From the Maison du Passeur pillbox to Nordscoot, no man's land was wide and mostly flooded. The Germans had built parapets and breastworks, since digging was impossible and there were no concrete artillery observation posts, which left the position vulnerable to attack. I Corps was to form the northern flank of the attack, by crossing the tongue of land between the Isar Canal and the floods at the march of out slash St. Jansbeek stream as far as Poezel, south of Nordschut. The first objective was over difficult going to the second of two German lines east of the Isar Canal and the second objective was the German third line further back. The advance was to follow a creeping barrage moving at 98 yards in four minutes, with pauses, to keep the French and British barrages level. Chapter 2 Section 3, German Defences The Fourth Army Operation Order for the Defensive Battle was issued on 27 June. The German defences had been arranged as a forward zone, main battle zone and rearward battle zone. The front system had three breastworks about 200 yards apart, garrisoned by the four companies of each front battalion, with listening posts in no man's land. About 2,000 yards behind these works was the Albrecht along the artillery protective line marking the rear boundary of the forward zone. Dispersed in front of the Albrecht along were divisional sharpshooter machine gun nests and half of the companies of the support battalions were in the pillboxes of the Albrecht along. The Albrecht along was the front of the main zone with the Wilhelm Stellung a further 2,000 yards behind at the rear of the main zone, which contained most of the field artillery. The reserve battalions of the regiments in the front position held the pillboxes of the Wilhelm Stellung. The rearward zone between the Wilhelm Stellung and Flondernei Stellung contained the support and reserve assembly areas for the Eingreif divisions. After the German failures at Verdun in December 1916 and at Arras in April 1917, when the forward zones had been overrun and the garrisons lost, these areas became more important. The main defensive engagement was expected to be fought in the main battle zone, against attackers who had been depleted and delayed by the forward garrisons, with reinforcements from the Eingreif divisions ready to engage if necessary. The Germans planned a rigid defense of the front system and forward zone, supported by counterattacks. Elastic defense, which allowed local withdrawals, was rejected by Fritz von Lorsberg, the new 4th Army Chief of Staff, because they would disorganize troops moving forward to counterattack. Frontline troops were to evacuate shelters as soon as the battle began and move forward or to the flanks, to avoid British artillery fire and to counterattack. Some machine gun nests and permanent garrisons were separate from the counterattack organization, to provide a framework for the defense in depth to be re-established once the counterattack had succeeded. 36 MG0815 machine guns had recently been added to each regiment, which gave the infantry more firepower to cover movement. The Luftstrike craft had about 600 aircraft in the 4th Army area, 200 being single-seat fighters, eventually 80 German air units operated over the Flanders front. Chapter 3, Rattle. Chapter 3 Section 1, Second Army Mist and unbroken cloud with a base from 500 to 800 feet high, 
meant that it was still dark when the British bombardment began at 3.50 a.m. due to the excellent observation possessed by the Germans, 3.50 a.m. was chosen for zero hour when the British, advancing from the west, would be able to see for about 200 yards, German troops would be looking westwards into darkness. The barrage stood for six minutes while the British infantry crossed the 200 to 300 yards of no man's land and assembled, then the barrage began to creep forward at 100 yards in four minutes. The attack extended from opposite Dulement in the Second Army area, north to the boundary with the Fifth Army, against the Warnerton Zanvoord line to simulate a threat against Lille. The ground was muddy after rain on the 29th of July and a drizzle began on the 31st of July before the attack. Two Anzac Corps on the right took the German outpost line west of the Lys River. The New Zealand Division captured La Basseville, southwest of Warnerton, after street fighting with the garrison, which eventually withdrew towards Warnerton, the 3rd Australian Division captured outposts and strong points near Gapard, east of Mazines. In 9 Corps, the 37th Division and the 19th Division advanced 500 yards on either side of the Wambeck and Rusebeck streams, past Oestavern and the spur between, towards the Blue Line 1000 to 1500 yards forward. The 19th Division attacked from Bee Farm in the south to Forret Farm in the north, with two battalions of the 37th Division attached to the right flank, to capture the Blue Line from July to Bee Farms, then revert to the 37th Division, to advance south of July Farm. The 19th Division attacked with the 56th Brigade, three battalions to attack and one in reserve. The attacking battalions assembled in the front line, and the support battalion in the old British front line behind Mazines Ridge, then moved into the front line after zero hour. The attack was supported by the 19th Divisional Artillery, the left group of the 37th Divisional Artillery, two six-inch batteries of core heavy artillery, plus a barrage from about 30 machine guns. The right battalion reached the objective very quickly, capturing junction buildings, tiny and spider farms, the 63rd Brigade battalions of the 37th Division formed a defensive flank by 4.10 a.m. and one gained touch with the rest of the division on the right but a gap 300 yards was left between Wasp Farm and Fly Buildings. Further to the left, a battalion of the 19th Division reached the Blue Line but further on, companies of the battalion to the left was pushed back near Forret Farm. German prisoners claimed to have been surprised by the early zero hour, mopping up and consolidation began in the dark dot at about 5.30 a.m., German artillery fire increased and troops were seen dribbling forward near Pilligrem's farm, on the left flank of the 37th Division. Engineers and pioneers had begun consolidating despite the German barrage and by 11 a.m. Tiny Farm had been fortified and communication trenches dug back to the old front line. More Germans were seen dribbling forward, small arms fire increased and at 6.40 a.m., a smoke screen rose at the junction of the 19th and 37th Divisions. A German counterattack began at 7.40 a.m. and parties of the 63rd Brigade on the right flank were overrun, only a few getting back to Tiny Farm. Reinforcements from the 19th Division were prevented from reaching the old front line by German machine gun fire. More reserves arrived and defensive flanks were formed until a counter-attack on Rifle Farm began at 8 p.m. The farm was captured then lost again. A second attack in the north on Forret Farm was repulsed late in the day and the 19th Division was ordered to consolidate but much of the X Corps artillery helped the 5th Army with counter-battery fire on German artillery behind Zanvoord, as the 41st Division attacked either side of the Ypres Comines Canal. Some German pillboxes had been built in columns, backwards from the front line, whose machine gunners kept up a steady fire. The strong points on the left were quickly suppressed but those on the right held out for longer and caused many casualties, before German infantry sallied from shelters between the front and support lines on the right flank. The Germans were repulsed by rifle fire and a Vickers machine gun fired by the battalion commander. Mopping up the remaining pillboxes failed, due to casualties and a shortage of ammunition. It began to rain and at 4 a.m. Germans were seen massing for a counter-attack. Reinforcements were called for and rapid fire opened on the German infantry but the attack reached, the UN captured pillboxes on the right. 
The British artillery replied as infantry reinforcements arrived, the Germans were forced back and the last pillboxes captured. The 41st Division had advanced about 600 to 650 yards on a 2,500 yards front, taking Hollebeck in the south and Kleinzillebeck, beyond Battlewood. Another advance waited on two corps to the north. Chapter 3 Section 2, 5th Army Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 2 2 Corps The main British effort was made by two corps across the Gelvialt Plateau, on the southern flank of the 5th Army. Two corps had the most difficult task, advancing against the principal German defensive concentration of artillery, Stellung's division and, and Eingreif divisions. The 17th Brigade on the right of 24th Division reached its objective 1,000 yards east of Kleinzillebeck, but the 73rd Brigade in the centre was stopped by fire from German pillboxes at Lower Star Post. The 72nd Brigade on the left reached the Bersevelebeek, then had to withdraw to a line south from Bodmin Copse, a few hundred yards short of the Blue Line. The 30th Division with four attached battalions of the 18th Division, had to advance across the Galevelt Plateau to Glencourse Wood. The 21st Brigade on the right lost the barrage as it struggled through the wreckage of Sanctuary Wood and took until 6 a.m. to capture Stirling Castle Ridge. Attempts to press on were stopped by German machine gun fire. The 90th Brigade on the left was stopped on the first objective. German artillery fire fell on Sanctuary Wood and Chateau Wood from 5 a.m. and stopped the advance, except for 300 yards south of Westhook Dot in the dark, a 30th Division battalion veered left and crossed the Menin Road north of a dobleg in the road, rather than to its south. When the battalion advanced slightly north of east as planned, the mistake led it into Chateau Wood to the north and it reported that it had captured its objective, Glencourse Wood to the east. The attached battalions of the 53rd Brigade of the 18th Division, moved forward across the Menin Road expecting the ground to be undefended and it was not until 9 a.m. that the mistake was discovered by the divisional commanders. The 53rd Brigade, troops, spent the rest of the day attacking an area that the 30th Division Battalion thought it had taken. The 30th Division and 24th Division failed to advance far due to the boggy ground, loss of direction in the dark and because many German machine guns remained intact, the 8th Division advanced towards Westhook and took the blue and black lines relatively easily. The southern flank then became exposed to German machine gun fire from Nonbortion and Glencourse Wood, opposite the 30th Division. The failure of the 30th Division further south was unknown to the 8th Division until just before the 25th Brigade was due to advance over Westhook Ridge. Brigadier General Clifford Coffin decided that it was too late to stop the attack and sent a company of the reserve battalion to fill the gap to the south but this did not prevent German enfilade fire. The 25th Brigade consolidated on the reverse slope and held the crest with Lewis gun posts. Pockets of ground lost to German hasty counterattacks were regained by more British attacks and artillery fire defeated later German attacks. Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 3 19 Corps 19 Corps attacked with 15th Division on the right, next to the 2nd Corps boundary along the Ypres Railway and 55th Division on the left, northwards to the outskirts of St. Julian. The black line was on Fresenberg Ridge and the green line was along the far side of the Steenbeek Valley. If the Germans collapsed, Reserve brigades were to advance towards the Red Line beyond Gravenstaffel. The advance began well but resistance from fortified farms caused delays, several tanks managed to get forward and attack strong points including Bank Farm and Border House, allowing the advance to continue. After a pause to consolidate on the Black Line, the reserve brigades advanced to the Green Line a mile beyond. The sun came out and a mist rose, on the right beyond the Ypres Rulers Railway, enfilade fire was received from the area not captured by the 8th Division. The 164th Brigade of the 55th Division, had to fight through many German strong points but took Hill 35 and crossed the Wilhelmstellung, an advance of about 4,000 yards. Patrols pressed on beyond the Zonnebeek Longemark Road and a platoon took 50 prisoners, at Aviatic Farm on the Graven Staffel Spur. 
Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 4 18 Core The 39th Division advanced at zero hour and the 116th Brigade of the 39th Division captured St. Julian and took 222 prisoners, supported by two tanks, which then silenced an artillery battery nearby. On the left of the division, the 117th Brigade rushed three pillboxes at Kansas Cross, killed the machine gunners and took several prisoners. Two tanks advanced on the Alberta Strong Point, flattened uncut wire and kept the garrison under cover as the infantry advanced. At the first objective, the infantry pausing for an hour and then moved, downhill, behind a smoke and shrapnel barrage, to the Steenbeek, one of the muddiest parts of the battlefield. By 8 a.m., both brigades had reached the final objective and were digging in on the east side of the Steenbeek. A battalion of the 3rd Guard Division was relieving Infantry Regiment 392 when the attack began and the 51st Division troops found many Germans in shell holes to take prisoner. The 152nd Brigade on the right, captured McDonald's farm after a volley of rifle grenades was fired inside and a tank fired from the right, which caused the survivors to surrender, 70 prisoners, a howitzer and two machine guns were captured. A tank suppressed the garrison of Ferdinand Farm and routed infantry from shell hole positions nearby. As the Scots reached the Steenbeek, machine gun fire from 60 yards beyond the opposite bank caused the cancellation of the plan to form a bridgehead at Maison du Rasta. On the left flank, the 153rd Brigade met resistance from Cane Wood and Rudolphy Farm which caused many casualties before they were overrun and 70 prisoners taken. Delays were met at Francois Farm and a strong point in a cemetery but around 10.30 am, outposts had been established on the rise beyond the Steenbeek. Both divisions dug in along the river for 3,000 yards from St. Julian northwards to the Pilkham Longamark Road. Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 5 14 Corps In the 14th Corps area, the Guards Division on the left flank crossed the Isa Canal on the afternoon of 27 July after a reconnaissance report from British airmen. The German front position was empty and the Guards lurked forward for 500 to 700 yards beyond, with French 1st Division conforming on the left. The 38th Division line on the right was already on the east side of the canal and encountered German small arms and artillery fire when it pressed forward. A regiment of the 23rd Reserve Division was sent forward that evening to recapture the front line. The British bombardment was so intense that only one battalion was able to counterattack. On the 31st of July, the British and French advanced 3,000 to 3,500 yards to the Steenbeek River. The preliminary bombardment had destroyed the German front position and the creeping barrage supported the infantry at least as far as the first objective. Infantry and a few tanks dealt with German strong points beyond the first position, penetrated the forward battle zone and pushed on. Several field batteries were brought forward once the black line had been captured, joining the masked batteries placed there before the attack. Cavalry probes began but German artillery and small arms fire stopped them short of the Green Line. Chapter 3 Section 3, 1 Rearmé By dawn on 30 July, the 1st and 51st Divisions of the 1 Rearmé had relieved the 2nd and 162nd Divisions under the cover of a gas bombardment, which increased in intensity as dawn approached and suppressed the German artillery. The canal was bridged downstream of Hetzas and mats were laid upriver for the attacking battalions, which moved up at the last minute and passed through the support battalions in the front line. On the east bank, the infantry moved round Boys 14 and Hangar Wood, Femme du Puy, House Fort, Vauban Fort, Maison de la Releve, the Casque, Diagonal Trench and the southern approaches of Terminal 8, protected by outposts established on the east bank since 28 July. At 3.50 a.m. on 31 July, under a thick overcast sky, I Corps attacked on a 3,000 yards front with the 1st Division on the right, and the 51st Division on the left. The French used 39 bridges thrown over the Isar Canal since the crossing on 27 July. 
The German first line north to Steenstraw was taken easily and then the advance began on the second position. French machine gun companies fired an overhead barrage from the B line 550 yards west of the canal, on woods behind the German second position, Coquelico Trench, Cortecchia, Smisk Cabaret, Mixcoot and the objectives at Stampcott Trench, Smisk Cabaret and around the Steenstraw Langwaite Road. No German machine guns fired on the French as they advanced and the German artillery fired no more than five or six shells per minute on each divisional front. The quantity of German artillery fire gradually increased on the right of the 51st Division, and on the Isar Canal. The 1st Division on the right flank reached the first objective at Ferme Charpentier and Ferme Hangar by 5.40 am on the left, the 51st Division reached Cask Trench, Pigeonier Trench and Stampcott Trench with few casualties. Around 5.45 a.m., the supporting battalions advanced towards the second objective north of Boys 15 and past the northeast edge of Triangle Wood and Ferme Turot, arriving before 7 a.m. German artillery barrages on Triangle Wood and machine gun fire on the right flank of the 1st Division caused more casualties. From 7.15 a.m., the battalions in Divisional Reserve sent reconnaissance parties forward towards Moulin Bleu Crossroads, Cortecchia Trench and Aubrey's Crossroads, which quickly reached their objectives. The reserve battalions leapfrogged the troops at the second objective and attacked towards the third objective, against determined resistance from pillbox and blockhouse garrisons, machine gunners in the remains of concrete shelters fired from close range which held up the battalion on the right flank of the 1st Division and pinned down a battalion of the 51st Division on the left flank at Big Scoot Blockhouse. German artillery began to bombard Cortecchia Trench and by 9 am, the French advance had been slowed. Near Poizel to the north, the German infantry made several ineffectual counter-attacks and the French also received intermittent artillery and machine gun fire. At about 10 am, Reports arrived from French contact patrol aircraft that the 1st Division had reached battery position 54.86, Ferme Sean and Ferme Tilliel and that 51st Division troops were at Chirot Wood, Aubrey's Crossroads, Poizel, Smisk Cabaret and Ferme Chapelle Sud. By 11 a.m., the 51st Division held a line from Coquelicot Trench to the south of Big Scoot, which was entered by patrols at about 10.30 a.m. Several prisoners were taken, Two battalions occupied the village and a line from Moulin Bleu crossroads to Ferme Cuirassiers, northeast of the village. Two batteries of 75mm field guns and one of 105mm guns crossed the canal over the bridge at Steenstra, and the British got 24 guns over the canal. Three artillery groups of the 74th Division and two of the 51st Division dug in north of Borsingand at 10.15 am. The guns annihilated German troops massing for a counter-attack on the right of the 1st Division north of Cortecchia Trench, after being spotted by French aircrew. By 1.30 pm, the 1st Division had advanced beyond the final objective level with the 51st Division at Big Scoot to a line from Ferme Cuirassiers, points 48.92 to 48.94 and Cortecchia Cabaret. Next to the Guards Division, the advance was held up around Ferme du Colonel but on the left flank, infantry of the 51st Division could be seen sheltering behind demolished breastworks. The sky had cleared around 2 p.m. and recognition flares were seen at several captured farmhouses. Aircrews gave warning of a counter-attack being prepared near Big Scoot which was repulsed at 5 o'clock p.m. I Corps had reached a line from Governor Trench to Smith's Cabaret, around Big Scoot, Ferme Cuirassiers Maison Ecosse and the battery position at point 54.86. After patrols from the 51st Division pushed northward and found no Germans near Poizel, Anthoin ordered a corps to advance to a line from the Marjuart cutting to the St. Jansbeek and Brunbeek streams, to create a defensive zone between Dree Grockton, and the confluence of the Corverbeek. The advance took ground useful for an attack on the right flank, over the Corverbeek between Drebank and Zefkoten, to the southern edge of Houthulst Forest. Many new French positions consisted of craters half full of water, which dissolved when connected. Contact with the rear was difficult over the shattered landscape, but the infantry had been issued supplies for four days. The German 2nd Guard Reserve Division advanced through Hauvolst Forest, towards the junction of the 5th and 1st Armies but the attack bogged down in deep mud. 
A prisoner said that of his company of about 150 men, barely 50 reached attacking distance and most of those took cover in shell holes. The next four days were exceptionally rainy, which added to the difficulty of supplying the new front line. Chapter 3 Section 4 Air Operations On 26 July, 37 RFC fighters engaged 50 Albatross scouts near Polygon Wood but four German reconnaissance aircraft slipped over the line and reconnoitred. Next evening, eight British aircraft over Menin lured about 20 Albatross scouts into an ambush over Polygon Wood by 59 fighters. Aircraft in the vicinity joined in and after an hour had shot down nine German aircraft, for an RFC loss of two aircraft, the German survivors withdrew. On 27 July, a RFC reconnaissance report enabled 14 corps to occupy 3,000 yards of the German front position. Next day in fine weather, the British conducted a large amount of air observation for counter-battery fire and detected German batteries which had been moved, flying was curtailed by poor weather on 29 and 30 July. By 31 July, the Allies had concentrated 840 aircraft from the Lys River to the sea, 330 being fighter aircraft. The French contributed three groups to Chassé including Group de Combat 12 2 bomber, three artillery observation squadrons and seven balloons. The air plan was cancelled because of thick, unbroken low cloud but a few pilots went up to freelance and some contact patrol pilots flew very close to the ground to observe the ground battle, 30 British aircraft were damaged by bullets and shells. Chapter 3 Section 5, German 4th Army At noon the advance on the 2nd Corps front had been stopped by the German ground-holding divisions and their artillery. News of the arrival of the British on the Green Line further north, 500 yards beyond the Steenbeek on the 19th Corps front at about 11 a.m. took a long time to reach the British divisional headquarters, because missed obstructed visual signalling, runners were slowed by the heavy going and signal cables were cut. Contact patrol crews reconnoitering the new front line found the British troops unwilling to light flares while overlooked from German defences. Around 3 p.m., Goff ordered all 19 Corps troops to advance to the Green Line to support the three fresh brigades there. Delays persisted and a German force approaching from behind the Brood St. Passchendaele Ridge was not seen by British aircraft. A message from a ground observer did not reach the 15th Division headquarters until 12.53 p.m. and rain began soon after, cutting off British artillery observers from view of the British troops furthest forward. At 2 p.m., a German creeping barrage began along 19 Corps front then German troops attacked the flanks of the most advanced British positions. The 39th Division on the left was pushed back to St. Julian, exposing the left flank of the 55th Division, just as it was attacked frontally over the Zonnebeck Spur by six waves of German infantry, preceded by a barrage and three aircraft which bombed and machine-gunned the British troops. Attempts to hold the ground between the black and green lines failed due to the communication breakdown, the speed of the German advance and worsening visibility as the rain increased during the afternoon. The 55th and 15th Division brigades beyond the Black Line were rolled up from north to south and were either overrun or retreated. It took until 6 p.m. for the Germans to reach the Steenbeek, where the downpour added to the mud and flooding in the valley. When the Germans were 300 yards from the Black Line, the British stopped the German advance with artillery and machine gun fire. The success of the British advance in the center of the front was a shock to the German commanders. The defensive system was designed to delay an attacker and create the conditions for an encounter battle, advantageous to the defenders, not the 4,000 yards advance achieved by 18 and 19 Corps. Regiments of the German 221st and 50th Reserve Divisions from Group Ypres near Passchendaele had begun a counter-attack from 11 o'clock to 11.30 a.m. The three advanced British brigades were depleted, unevenly spread and out of touch with their artillery, due to the rain and smoke shell in the German creeping barrage. The German infantry drove the British back from the Green Line along the zonnebeck Longemark Road, the 19th Corps brigades retreating to the Black Line. The Germans recaptured St. Julian just west of the Green Line on the 18th Corps front, where the counter-attack was stopped by mud, 
artillery and machine gun fire. The three British brigades had suffered 70% casualties by the time they reached the Black Line. German counterattacks on the flanks had little success. In the 14th Corps area, German attacks made no impression against dug in British troops but managed to push back a small bridgehead of the 38th Division from the east bank of the Steenbeek, after the German infantry had suffered many casualties from British artillery as they were advancing around Longemark. The Guards Division, north of the Ypres Staden Railway, held its ground, the French repulsed German counterattacks around Saint Janschuk and followed up the repulse to capture Bix Scoot. German counterattacks in the afternoon against two corps on the Galevelt Plateau, to recapture Westhook Ridge, got forward a short distance from Glencourse Wood before the 18th Division artillery and a counterattack pushed them back again. In the 2nd Army area, south of the plateau at La Basseville, a powerful counterattack at 3.30 pm was repulsed by the New Zealand Division. X Corps also managed to hold its gains around Klein Zillebeck against a big German attack at 7 pm. Chapter 4 Aftermath Chapter 4 Section 1 Analysis On the 4th of August, Haig claimed to the cabinet that the attack was a success and that casualties had been low for such a big battle. 31,850 men the 31st of July to 2 slash the 3rd of August, compared to 57,540 losses on the 1st of July 1916. An advance of about 3,000 yards had been achieved in the center and north. German observation areas on the highest part of the Galevelt Plateau near Clapham Junction and the ridge from Belvoir to Pilkham had been captured, Nine German divisions had been shattered and hurriedly relieved by the first echelon of Eingrave divisions. The reliefs of the ground holding divisions implied that fresh divisions had replaced them, beginning the process of drawing German divisions to Flanders, away from the bulk of the French armies. An unusually large number of German dead were counted and more than 6,000 prisoners had been taken along with 25 guns. The 9 5th Army divisions had been intended to gain the Green Line, possibly up to parts of the Red Line and then be capable of pressing on to the Passchendaele Staden Ridge before needing to be rested. The Green Line had been reached in the north but only part of the Black Line on the Galevelt Plateau, at a cost of 30-60% casualties and about half of the tanks knocked out or bogged down. The defensive power of the Eingreif divisions had been underestimated and the attacking divisions, having easily advanced for one mile in three hours, had been exposed to observed machine gun and artillery fire for the rest of the day, most of the British casualties were suffered after the advance. The postponements of the attack prolonged the preliminary bombardment to six days and wet ground, particularly in the Bersevela Beak, Hannabeek and Steenbeek valleys had become crater fields that flooded in rain. The German guns behind the Galevelt Plateau had been most effective against the artillery of the 2 and 19 Corps, firing high explosive and mustard gas shells, which caused many casualties to the British gunners, who could not be rested during the preparatory period. The British fired a record amount of ammunition, but had to distribute it as far back as Flondern and Estellung, where its effect was wasted. The French official historians wrote in 1937 that the artillery preparation had been most effective and that as the French I Corps troops advanced swiftly over devastated ground, morale soared as they saw that even the largest German concrete blockhouses and strong points had been destroyed. The French attack recovered most of the ground lost in the German gas attack of the 22nd of April 1915. In 1996, Pryor and Wilson wrote that the French 1st Army, 14 Corps, 18 Corps and 19 Corps advanced about 3,000 yards, took two German defensive positions and deprived the Germans of their observation posts on Pilkham Ridge, a substantial achievement despite the later repulse of the 18 and 19 Corps from the areas of the Green and Red Lines. Two Corps on the Galevelt Plateau had only advanced about 1,000 yards beyond the Albrechtstelung but took Belward Ridge and Stirling Castle. The training of the 5th Army troops had enabled them to use Lewis guns, rifle grenades, trench mortars and tanks to overwhelm German pillboxes, when the artillery had managed to neutralize the defenders of a sufficient number of blockhouses in advance. Casualties were about the same, unlike the 1st of July 1916 when the British had only inflicted a few thousand on the Germans. 
The 5th Army captured about 18 square miles on 31 July compared to only 3.5 square miles on the first day of the Somme but the German defensive success on the Gaelevelt Plateau left the British in the centre open to enfilade fire from the right, contributing to the greater number of losses incurred after the advance had stopped. Goff was criticised for setting objectives that were too ambitious, causing the infantry to lose the barrage and become vulnerable to the German afternoon counter-attacks. Pryor and Wilson wrote that the failure had deeper roots, since successive attacks could only be spasmodic as guns were moved forward, a long process that would only recover the ground lost in 1915. This was far less than the results Haig had used to justify the offensive, in which great blows would be struck, the German defences would collapse and the British would be able safely to advance beyond the range of supporting artillery to the Passchendaele and Clerken ridges, then towards rulers, Thauaut and the Belgian coast. The German counter-bombardments had been effective and their Eingreif divisions had not crumpled, leaving open only the possibility of a slow tactical success, rather than a strategic triumph. In 2008, J. P. Harris called the attack on 31 July a remarkable success compared to 1 July 1916, with only about half the casualties and far fewer fatalities, inflicting about the same number on the Germans. Interrogations of prisoners convinced Haig that the German army had deteriorated. The relative failure on the Gaelevelt Plateau and the repulse in the centre from the Red Line and parts of the Green Line by German counterattacks did not detract from this, several counterattacks having been defeated. Had the weather been dry during August, the German defence might have collapsed and the geographical objective of the offensive, the recapture the Belgian coast, might have been achieved. Much rain fell on the afternoon of 31 July and the rain in August was unusually severe, having a worse effect on the British, who had more artillery and a greater need to get artillery observation aircraft into action in the conditions of rain and low cloud. Mud paralysed manoeuvre and the Germans were trying to hold ground rather than advance, an easier task regardless of the weather. Chapter 4 Section 2 Casualties In 1931, Hubert Goff wrote that 5,626 prisoners had been taken on 31 July. The British official history recorded 5th Army casualties for 31 July to 3 August as 27,001, of which 3,697 were fatal. 2nd Army casualties were 4,819 men, 769 being fatalities. The 19th Division suffered 870 casualties. In 1937, the French official historians recorded a maximum of 1,800 First Army casualties from 26 to 31 July, about 1,300 suffered on 31 July, of whom 180 men were killed. In 2014, Elizabeth Greenhalgh recorded 1,300 French casualties in I Corps. The 4th Army casualties for 21-31 July were circa 30,000 men. James Edmonds, the British official historian, added another 10,000 likely wounded to the total, to make casualty totals comparative, a practice which has been questioned ever since. According to Albrecht von Tier, the chief of staff of Gruppe Weidschate, units which survived physically no longer had the mental ability to continue. Chapter 5 Subsequent Operations Chapter 5 Section 1, Southern Flank On the Second Army Front, German artillery kept up constant artillery fire on the new British front line, which with the rain, caused the British great difficulty in consolidating the captured ground. In the Second Army area, on 1 August, a German counter-attack on the front of the 3rd Australian Division, reached the Warnerton line before being stopped by artillery and machine gun fire. An attack by the 19th and 39th Divisions on 3 August, to regain the portion of the first objective was cancelled when a battalion occupied the ground unopposed. The 41st Division captured Forret Farm on the night of 1-2 August and the 19th Division pushed observation posts forward to the Blue Line. Chapter 5 Section 1 Subsection 2 Operation Summer Night Operation Summer Night was a German methodical counterattack near Hollebeck in the Second Army area on the southern flank, 
which began at 5.20 a.m. on 5 August. The 22nd Reserve Division had been relieved by the 12th Division, and the 207th Division, after its losses on 31 July. After a short bombardment, three companies of I Battalion, Infantry Regiment 62 of the 12th Division captured a slight rise 0.62 miles northeast of Hollebeck, surprising the British, who fell back 87 yards. The new German positions were on higher and drier ground and deprived the British of observation over the German rear, reducing casualties from British artillery fire. Further to the south, Reserve Infantry Regiments 209 and 213 of the 207th Division attacked Hollebeck through thick fog and captured the village, despite many casualties, taking at least 300 prisoners. Most of the British were in captured pillboxes and blockhouses, which had to be attacked one by one and at 5.45 am, three signal flares were fired to indicate success. The Germans later abandoned Hollebeck and reoccupied the older line, then withdrew to their start line because of the severity of British counterattacks and artillery fire. Zormanokt left the front line ragged, with a 440 yards gap between regiments 209 and 213. The British tried to exploit the gap, which led to attack and counterattack before the bigger British attack of the 10th of August against the Gaelevelt Plateau. Chapter 5 Section 2 Center On the 1st of August, a German counterattack on the 5th Army Front, at the boundary of the 2 and 19 Corps, managed to push back the 8th Division for a short distance south of the Ypres Rulers Railway. North of the line, the 15th Division stopped the attack with artillery fire. Two battalions of the 8th Division counter-attacked and restored the original front line by 9 p.m. on the afternoon of 2 August, the Germans attacked again on the 15th and 55th Division fronts in 19 Corps and were repulsed from the area around Pommern Redoubt. A second attempt at 5 p.m. was crushed by artillery fire, the Germans retiring behind Hill 35. German troops reported in Kitchener's Wood opposite the 39th Division in the 18th Corps area were bombarded, St. Julian was reoccupied and posts established across the Steenbeek north of the village, more advanced posts were established by the 51st Division on 3 August. A German attack on 5 August recaptured part of Jehovah Trench from the 24th Division in two Corps, before being lost again the next day. On 7 August, the Germans managed to blow up a bridge over the Steenbeek, at Chien Farm in the 20th Division area. On the night of 9 August, the 11th Division took the Maison Bulgare and Maison du Rasta pillboxes unopposed and pushed posts another 150 yards beyond the Steenbeek. An attempt by the 11th Division to gain more ground was stopped by fire from Knoll 12. The 29th Division took Passerel Farm and established posts east of the Steenbeek, building 12 bridges across the river. The neighboring 20th Division inched forward on 13 August and on 14 August took Mill Mound and four reinforced concrete infantry shelters. The British had to dig in short of the Aubonjit blockhouse and repulsed a German counterattack the next day. Chapter 5 Section 2 Subsection 2 Capture of West Hook the Gaelevelt Plateau was a sea of mud, flooded shell craters, fallen trees and barbed wire. Troops were quickly tired by rain, mud, massed artillery bombardments and lack of food and water, rapid relief of units spread the exhaustion through all the infantry, despite fresh divisions taking over. The 5th Army bombarded the German defences from Polygon Wood to Lollamark but the German guns concentrated their fire on the plateau. Low cloud and rain grounded British artillery observation aircraft and many shells were wasted. The 25th Division, 18th Division and the German 54th Division, had taken over by the 4th of August but the German 52nd Reserve Division was left in line, by zero hour on the 10th of August, both sides were exhausted. Some troops of the 18th Division quickly reached their objectives but German artillery isolated those around Inverness Cops and Glencourse Wood. German counterattacks recaptured the Cops and all but the northwest corner of Glencourse Wood by nightfall. The 25th Division on the left reached its objectives by 5.30 am, and rushed the Germans in Westhook. 
Both sides suffered many casualties during artillery bombardments and German counterattacks. Chapter 5 Section 3 Northern Flank The French 1st and 51st Divisions had suffered relatively few casualties and La Capelle ordered them to continue their attacks up to the Steenbeek. On 4 August, amidst a downpour, the French edged forward of Cortecier Cabaret southeast of Bix Scoot and took two farms west of the Steenstra Woman Road. During 8 and 9 August, the French took more ground to the northwest of Bix Scoot. On 6 August, Le Capel had directed that I Corps should drive out the Germans from their remaining positions west of the Marchuart and establish good defensive positions from Poiselle, along the Marchuart inundations southwards past Fem General and Lubeck to point 55.99 and on the south bank of the Steenbeek. From 4 to 6 August, the 1st and 51st Divisions were relieved by the 2nd and 162nd Divisions and from 7 August, I Corps held a line from Ferme Sans Nom to the Orchard, Petite Ferme and Ferme 17. On 8 August Ferme Lubeck was taken unopposed, but on 9 August, the French advanced closer to Langwaid, which appeared weakly held, the 2nd Division took Ferme André Smits and Camellia. At dawn on 10 August, French Marines attacked over the drier ground in the Big Scoot area to gain more jumping off points for an attack on Drieg Rockton north of the confluence of the Yser Canal and the Steenbeek. After an advance between the Yser Canal and the lower reaches of the Steenbeek, the west side of the inundations was occupied and bridgeheads were established across the Steenbeek. Five guns were captured and with the French close to Merkham and over the Steenbeek near St. Janschuk, the German defences at Drieg Rockton were outflanked from the south and Longmark made vulnerable from the northwest. By the 10th of August, the I Corps front ran from Cortecia Cabaret, Ferme du Jaloux, des Voltigeurs, Camellia, André Smits, the northern fringe of Bix Scoot, Ferme du Lubic, du Bosquet, 16, 15, and 17.